Awesome. Welcome to Rice Learning Machines Seminars. I am Olaf Mugden, and I am a research, researcher on foundational and applied machine learning at RISE. RISE is Sweden's public research institute, and this is our openly, open weekly seminar on AI and machine learning. This meeting will be recorded. Let us know if you want to be removed from this recording. And check out the collection of great talks we have on our YouTube channel. Today, I have the pleasure to introduce Charlie Fiesler, who is a postdoc at the Zimmer Lab at uh, the University of Vienna. Charlie has a PhD in physics uh, from the University of Washington, where he was focusing on, on modeling the neuronal activity using data-driven control theory. His re research interests include developing practical pipelines for analyzing microscopy data and working on uh, minimal brains, analyzing them and understanding their design principles. And the today's topic is uh, the, the humble one of how to build a brain. Welcome, Charles, and the uh, floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, thank you. I tried to tried to be punchy with the title. Um, I hope that uh, yeah, we'll see how it goes. We'll see how it goes. Um, I, I I changed it here in the in the. Um, in the <laughs> PowerPoint, how to build a tiny brain. I, I, I humbleified it a little bit. Slightly yeah. more humble. Yeah. Is it looking forward to it? Yes, sweet. Okay. Sounds good. So um yes, thank you. Thank you so much. As mentioned, my name is um Charles. I usually go by Charlie. Um and I'm from the University of Vienna. In my talk, I'll be talking about how to build a tiny brain. So uh just a tiny bit about me. I have a physics PhD as mentioned, but I was kind of dissatisfied and I moved over to the computational side of everything. And uh, that was in the applied math department at the University of, of Washington. And so I did a lot of data-driven stuff. Um, that's a big envelope. Um, I would call it more dynamical systems modeling. Um, but then recently I've been doing more with AI, um, especially to do image processing um, and a little bit uh, of modeling as well. Um, and in this talk, I will focus on um, starting out with some like big picture stuff. I'm not gonna jump into exactly what I've been doing right at the beginning, real motivational stuff. Then I'll talk about my work and then I'll try to get some speculation and maybe get uh, some thoughts from you guys. And let me see if I can get a, a zoom. Can I get a little thingy thingy laser pointer? Aha, here we go, sweet. Okay, beautiful. So to start out with, um, I actually want to maybe go a little bit more towards this audience, which is just to talk about AI and in particular the history of AI. And then I'll connect this up to neuroscience in a, in a second. But uh, you may be familiar, but there have been many uh, ups and downs in AI. There've been some AI winters and the paradigm, the philosophy of AI has, has changed a couple of times. And one of the most prominent philosophies back in the eighties, uh, and I, I got this book, which was published in 1981, uh, was really focused on rules. So this, uh, for example, is a rule set that uh, describes a quote-unquote AI of the time for playing tic-tac-toe, right? So it's basically a set of, of if statements, and it's kind of a branching thing. Depending on what moves are done, uh, then you, the, the AI will do the next move. And, and then, as you can see down here, then the AI wins, right? And for something simple like tic-tac-toe, you can do this. Um, but... This was a paradigm. This was a research paradigm, right? It wasn't just one project. People really tried to say, look, can we get general intelligence uh, using this paradigm? Can we build an artificial brain using this? So out in the world, you might have uh, an AI, which uh, is trying to understand birds, and it'll have some kind of subset relationship between a category, and it'll have a sort of ownership relationship between another category of wings and and so on. And then people try to basically, you know, program a very, very, very long list of all possible relationships in the world, mothers and, and daughters and husbands and wives and, and, you know, dead people and living people, just, just program it all in, just, just put the rules in. That's the, that's the approach. That's the philosophy. And I think you can understand how this um, quickly gets kind of out of hand. You know, you have like a specific Robin, which is this, and then you have a specific robin which has like a nest, and then it's this nest has a category, and then you just you just kind of explode, right? You explode very quickly, um, and then you add time into the equation, and 
it's just very difficult to do this, which of course is why that's not what we're doing today in AI. Uh, th this paradigm was a very, very popular thing, very strong uh, rules-based, logic-based paradigm for a long time, um, but something did replace it. But uh, not before some successes. So there were some medical recommender systems. These are mostly uh, research systems. I'm not sure exactly how to say all these names. Mycin, internist. Uh, if you're interested, um, I think that the history of these guys is, is quite interesting. Um, in certain academic departments, basically, uh, this is almost exclusively what they did. This is what they called AI, right? They, they had this kind of rule-based, logic-based recommender systems, right? Um, another uh, interesting real-world success story is some engineering companies. So the, like the chemicals company DuPont, um, they were actually using these kinds of systems in practice. Um, and uh, they called them expert systems. Um, and I, I really liked this, this uh, slide from a 1988 presentation. Computer programming for capturing knowledge and delivering it to the point of attack. So it's a very 80s way of, of talking about uh, talking about business, let's say. Um, and, and one of the things that they were doing, which I think is also kind of similar to some of the stuff that, that we're trying to do with AI, is take, take a complicated knowledge base that is uh, distributed and, and sometimes contradictory, and then align it and make one uh, agent which has all of that knowledge. I mean, of course, right now, the, the canonical example is something like ChatGPT, right, which takes this huge, huge heterogeneous set of data and then can kind of give you one agent which which you can talk to. Um, and, and a lot of these are actually text-based uh, conversation systems. Um, but the question, which I'll return to, um, you know, is does it scale? And of course, I think that uh, the current status of AI kind of tells us a little bit about that question, which is that we're not doing that anymore. But uh, let's, let's, let's return to this question in a moment. Because there's a, there's a very strong analogy to this philosophy, this AI paradigm uh, in neuroscience. And one thing that people really have, have liked, uh, one thing that people really have studied a lot is the individual units, like neurons and the molecular biology of them. This is under the broad category, basically, of reductionism, right? You take a complicated system and you try to understand its tiniest parts, its simplest parts. Um, one key word that people use um, is Sharingtonian. I don't think it's that important to, to remember that, but just in case you want to look that up in the future. Um, and, and the point of this paradigm is to have node to node connections, right? One cell to another cell, one neuron to another neuron. And then you try to mathematically describe things about those cells, right? One transfer function, one activation function. And then when you get into more complicated um, assays or when you're trying to study the real world, you will publish a paper which says this neuron is representing this thing. This neuron is doing this thing. This neuron is responsible for this thing. This neuron is implementing this logical rule, basically, right? So it's an analogous paradigm um, as, as the, the uh, logic-based AI paradigm that I just mentioned. Um, and one example of, of a success of this paradigm, because just like in the AI case, you do have successes in this paradigm. Uh, there's a really interesting um, assay, which I'll, I'll mention a couple times, so I do want to explain it a tiny bit. Um, in neuroscience, people study monkeys a lot, and uh, there's this really famous thing where they have to look, and then there are these targets, and then they have to make some decision. And in this case, you have some kind of set of dots here which are moving either to the right or to the left. And they have to integrate this information and then make a decision. So, so their decision is just with their eyes and they're looking to the left if it's uh, the motion here was to the left and they're looking to the right if the motion here was to the right. And people are interested in this because it's, it's a, an example of a thing that the brain does, which we can hope to understand kind of in all of its parts, right? This, this reductionist paradigm. Um, and what a model or an explanation in this reductionist paradigm would look like is that you have your dot motion that goes into one or like a couple neurons, let's say, and some of the neurons are going to increase if it's going to the right, some of the neurons are going to decrease if it's going to the right, and then that adds up to some sort of super noisy neural activity, but then that neural activity can get added up 
and integrate it into an evidence variable, basically, which could be explicitly represented by a different neuron or, or a set of neurons, let's say. Um, but this evidence is accumulated. And then when it gets to some threshold, a decision happens, boom, the eyes move, the monkey either gets the reward or doesn't. And I bring this up because this, this, there's really good evidence for that, right? You, you can actually uh, build a brain in this way, at least to solve this task, right? Like you can get, you can build a circuit, you could do an explanation at the level of single neurons and single connections between neurons. So basically you've done this logic, logical rule set. Like you can, you can do that for certain tasks, yeah? Um, and another success story, although it's a little bit more abstract, um, is uh, convolutional neural networks in, in general. Um, now, you probably know this, but convolutional neural networks originally came out of, uh, let's say the inspiration for them came out of studies of the visual system. And uh, there's this kind of idea of layers in the visual system, and there's this idea of, of uh, pooling and, and simple going to complex. Um, and it's not exactly true in the visual system, but you have some kind of uh, translation invariance, um, although there are interesting uh, exceptions. But anyway, this is a study at the single neuron level or basically uh, you know, a couple neuron levels, right? So the circuit level. And you can really understand something from this, right? Like you can really uh, gain knowledge that can be applied more broadly. And this, this paradigm, right, has successes, yeah. But it's the same question. Um, and, and in my mind, I mean, I titled this, you know, how to build a brain. And I would argue that even though there are some successes here, uh, and just like in the logic space, I think there are some successes. I don't think that this is really how you build a brain. I think it's how the brain does certain things but I don't think that it actually scales to everything that a brain does need to do. But then the question is, uh, you know, what, what do we do instead of that? Um, and I, I just kind of want to highlight here, uh, especially because my background is in physics, um, that there's this kind of reductionist bias in, in a lot of different sciences and in particularly in physics, right? A lot of people, uh, they say, oh, look, I'm, I'm in physics and I, chemistry is not really that interesting because it's just applied physics, right? And biology is not that interesting because it's just applied chemistry and, and so on, right? You can, you can get this whole thing and perhaps you put somebody at the top of the pile, but uh, basically there's this reductionist bias and, and people can feel very excited about it. Um, but I, I think that there are very interesting arguments in physics, but especially in neuroscience, it really is true. I think that more is different. You can understand things at the single neuron level. You can understand things at the single uh, gap junction or the single neuron to neuron connection level. And that is good science. But uh, when you add it together to be a brain, you actually need different principles. You need a different paradigm. You cannot just keep adding up uh, your, your, your studies or your papers on, you know, at this level or at this size scale, and then immediately derive everything in chemistry or derive everything in biology, right? We, we, I think it's obvious that we have a, a deep understanding of physics, but that does not just immediately solve every other problem in, in the universe, right? All right, can I click? There we go. So an alternative paradigm, and, and one of the reasons why it's really exciting to be in neuroscience right now um, is this population level explanation of neuroscientific phenomena. And this is really cool because the, the whole field is kind of um, simultaneously expressing both of these paradigms. Um, uh, there's kind of a transition, let's say, within certain labs in the last like five, 10 years. But it's really very new um, that people have been able to, to publish papers and, and to understand things at this level. Um, and again, for historical reasons, this is called Hopfieldian. You're probably familiar with like Hopfieldian uh, sort of early types of uh, neural networks or dynamical systems, um, but the name is not that important. The point really is that instead of explaining things, instead of publishing things at the single neuron level, you publish things at a higher level of some sort of space or some sort of representational phase space. In this case, you have a basin of attraction and you have fixed points and you have flow between the fixed points. It's, it's, a, it's a more abstract thing, um, but, you, but you definitely can do some interesting successful uh, you can do very interesting, um, successful applications of this paradigm as well. And one recent uh, interesting application is in brain-computer interfaces. 
So it's actually a very similar paradigm, but instead of uh, with a monkey who is looking in a certain direction, right? But instead of uh, looking at something and then making a decision, we are looking at its brain and then we as the humans or as the computers are trying to make a decision as to what the intention of the animal was. Did it want to do this? What, what is the decision it wanted to do just from its brain activity, just from the spikes? Um, and this uh, paper, well, if you're familiar with this field, there there's a lot of excitement, but there's also a lot of di difficulties with this. And in particular, um, these neurons can kind of drift around in what they're doing. It really appears like the single neuron, the meaning of a single neuron is not actually static over the course of days. Um, and, and that's called drift, yeah. Um, and one possible solution that this paper, of course, there was a lot of work behind it, but loosely speaking, they use population level features. And I'll get into what that means in detail in a little bit. Um, but they use population level features to stabilize this across days and to calibrate this across days. And this can stabilize the, the, um, the decoding of the intention, the decoding of the decision, right? So it's actually very similar to the previous thing, but there is uh, now a population level concept, a population level explanation here. And I think that uh, this is kind of bringing me into uh, the first partial basic building block answer to how to build a brain that, that I want to explore in more detail. Um, and, and there's this buzzword or keyword manifold. Um, but really what that means is just that there's some kind of like uh, coordinated activity over the brain. So if we come back to this, this monkey that's trying to make a decision, right, left or right, uh, we can actually do this paradigm or do this, do this assay, do this experiment from the population paradigm and, under, and try to understand, okay, look, you know, maybe, maybe in certain animals or in certain tasks, single neurons are doing something that looks like this decision. But is that decision also actually spread across the population? Is that information actually uh, represented across the brain? Um, and that is potentially a more general strategy to do things. And, and I think that if I just go through this panel by panel, there's uh, the same assay, left and right dots. There's some kind of set of neurons which are either increasing or decreasing. They're firing more or fewer spikes. And there's some kind of representation um, in, in a lower dimensional space that is the average firing rate and then reflects this decision, this brown being one decision, this blue being the other decision. But the interesting thing in particular about this paper um, is that they studied multiple tasks, one of which was this classic task, um, and another one which was a much more abstract task of human and monkey classification. So you had this uh, picture that was shown and then they had to decide in the same way on the left here, they have to decide something, but they have to decide something much more abstract, which is, is this a human or is this a monkey? And I think it's pretty easy to understand that this is a much more complex visual task, right? I'm not gonna have like one neuron in the retina which, which can do this. Uh, all, and, and perhaps I could have a very simple neuron which could do this. But this is a much more abstract task. And they were able to find that in the same way, uh, across the population, there's this kind of evidence accumulation, evidence distribution, and then decision making that happens. But it's kind of a rotation of the, the thing on the left. So it's like the same neurons are participating, the same neurons are doing something. You know, they're not actually just dedicated to this task. Same neurons, um, but they're, they're, the decision making, the exact geometry is, is a little bit different. Um, and so this is a way where you can kind of, I think, imagine, like, let's say I need to solve a million different tasks in the world. This is one fundamental building block of how you could, uh, how you could solve a large set of these decision making tasks uh, without having to dedicate one neuron to every single task uh, that, that you could be faced with. Okay, so um, now we come into more what I work on, which is not monkeys. And I think that the, uh, a very interesting question is, you know, like people, people do stuff with manifolds and humans and with monkeys and with mice to some extent, um, but do they actually exist only in quote unquote advanced animals? Um, 
And a really important reason for asking that question is that neuroscience is very, very complicated. And there are a lot of things going on. I mean, in these monkey studies, you know, you're imaging, let's say, 100 neurons out of, you know, a billion or something like this. Uh, and, and it's very difficult to make the claim that you're really like understanding the brain if you're if you're imaging such a small portion. I, I'm exaggerating a little. People can do more than 100. But uh, in principle, it's a, a very small fraction and it's in one region, usually maybe two regions. And, and there's just a huge amount that's going on in this brain. And so it could be that you're um, observing something that's that's not as fundamental as you thought. Um, yeah. So this is the key question. How basic are manifolds? Are they really like a building block? Are they the starting point, let's say, of how to build a brain? That, that, uh, um, or are they kind of an emergent, higher scale phenomenon? Um, yeah. So I study worms. I study uh, C. elegans, which are, which are one millimeter long little wormies, and they have various behaviors, which I hope you will come to know and love over the course of, of this, the rest of this presentation. Um, and fundamentally, they're just amazing. They're just amazing. All right. So let me take you with me. One of the big questions that we're trying to answer at this worm level of neuroscience is, is how to build a brain or to get a little bit more specific, how does the brain organize the behavior that it outputs, right? Um, and luckily, you, me, and everybody else on the Zoom call, uh, we are all living through a revolution in neuroscience, um, which is simultaneous, the ability to simultaneously record many, many neurons. Um, in, in some cases, it's up to a million neurons, um, but certainly in, in the worm, you can actually image the almost the entire brain, every single neuron in the brain. Um, so it's not just a revolution right in AI or in this population level doctrine, right? This, this revolution at the conceptual level has been driven by this revolution at the, at the uh, experimental level. And that revolution, uh, the, one of the main uh, star players of, of this experimental revolution is something called GCAMP, or it's calcium sensitive fluorescent proteins. So specifically, this will light up or, or will give off photons as a neuron uh, changes its activity. So neurons have like voltage levels or calcium levels, and this allows you to actually visualize that in, in a regular microscope. Um, and what does that look like across animals? Uh, it looks it looks like this. So you can see this is like a fish brain, and you can see these neurons lighting up. Uh, these are these are spiking friends, and this I believe is Drosophila. It's a fly, uh, and you can see many 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 neurons. And this is our friend, the C. elegans, the worm, where you can really get the entire brain uh, together, and and uh, try to understand as much as possible everything about the brain. I mean. It's biology, so you don't understand everything, but but we're gonna we're, we're getting there. Um, and one of the most interesting observations across uh, these these species is of something like I mentioned with the monkeys is this kind of this, uh, version of this manifold concept. But let me get more specific. Specifically, uh, a, a distributed observation across uh, model organisms is that there's a brain-wide shared encoding of behavior. So, for example, in in mouse. This is a recording of the visual cortex. As the mouse is running on a ball or uh, sitting, just being stationary, running, sitting, running, sitting, uh, the entire brain in this sensory region, this primary sensory processing region, lights up and many, many, many neurons are active in response to this behavior, even though this is a sensory area. And this is similar in flies where you can uh, image a, a large portion of the brain and, and in the same way, their global activity state is somehow represented kind of across the brain, not just in motor areas. And in a similar way, in C. elegans, uh, you have this global forward backward state switch, which, which I'll show you more pretty pictures of or pretty videos of. And you can see that uh, this is represented quite broadly throughout the brain. And, and we'll get into that in, in detail. Uh, but but the function of this is not quite well understood. You know, I told you a pretty story um, at the very vague level about manifolds, and maybe that's like some kind of population level like thing. But really diving into the details, we want to know like, you know, what does this actually do? Is this actually functional in the way that we think it might be? Uh, is it hiding other things, uh, which I will get to? Um, 
or is it like an artifact? Is it is it just kind of an accident of of uh, these things, and it's just not that important for the brain, right? The, you always have to keep that in mind. Um, so, what do we actually know about this phenomenon? What do we know about these these shared motor representations or this manifold? Well, in many of these animals, it's dominant. So it's a large percentage of the neural activity. In C. elegans, it's up to 50% of the entire uh, uh, activity of the brain is, is caught up in this one pattern, in this one manifold uh, uh, component. Um, and it's not such a high percentage in, in mice and, and flies, but it's still uh, the dominant component of the variance. It's also distributed. I've mentioned this a couple of times. It's not just in motor areas. It's not just in decision making or command areas. It's also in sensory areas. It's really everywhere. Um, and it's intrinsic, uh, which, which I will get to uh, in a little bit, right? It's not actually just dependent on motor execution. It actually happens even if the animal is like immobilized or, or just thinking about doing a, a behavior. Just thinking about this behavior is enough to cause this activity which is, I think, a crucial uh, part of understanding what's going on. The function, uh, yeah, there's lots, of, there's lots of question marks, um, um, which, which I'll dive into, yeah. Um, in particular, though, I do want to highlight that uh, there can be multiple reasons for correlated activity, right? I, I showed you some correlated activity, but correlation is not causation. And uh, there could be multiple different causal pathways for producing this correlated activity. Um, and the, one of the superpowers of C. elegans is that we can image almost the entire brain, but we also know a huge amount about the brain. And so we can actually directly compare the exact same neurons in, in multiple situations, in this case, in immobilized animals and freely moving animals. And I'll get into that. And I'll talk about some hypotheses for a function of this. So let me tell you a little bit about prior work and sort of the state of the field and get you get you excited about the present day. So um, about 10 years ago, um, the, the Zimmer lab was, was a pioneering lab in this whole brain or nervous system wide imaging of neuronal activity. And we did we it's kind of sad. We sort of tortured the animals. We, we had to squish them into this little uh, this little device where they couldn't move. Um, and then we could image this field of view. Uh, where you, this is the video I showed you earlier, where you can see the, the neurons lighting up, uh, up and down and up and down and doing interesting things here and doing interesting things here and doing interesting things down here. And this was the first time that people could really study the whole brain, right? Could study, could study almost the whole brain, I should say, here. Um, and uh, there were huge questions because most of the prior work was at the circuit level paradigm, right? You take one neuron, you take maybe two neurons and you try to understand, let's say, the decision that's made, or you try to understand something computational that, that the brain is doing, but that's the data you have, right? You only have this one or two neuron time series, and you don't understand the context of the brain. You have no way to even understand if there is context in the rest of the brain. And so this was really revolutionary because you could actually understand everything all together. Yeah. Um, and when we when we put that together in a heat map, it looks like this. And I think that the, the most dominant thing that you can see is this big pattern, this single switching pattern, where these friends here uh, are, are co-active, they're active together, and these friends here are active in the other at the other time points. They're 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 anti-correlated here. And uh, one way to visualize this is with PCA, principal component analysis, which just projects this into a linear low dimensional subspace. It's a linear autoencoder. And in this case, people were very excited because this space, this low dimensional space actually forms a structured, um, smooth uh, time series. It, it's kind of like this population level, you know, flow that I described in this, this population level paradigm. So people were really excited when they first saw this, but it's not just smooth. It's not just pretty. It's also reflecting the behavioral state. And I wanna, wanna emphasize that this is a fictional action sequence. So these, these colors um, are colored by what the animal is intending to do. So it goes forward, that's one of its basic motor programs, it goes backwards, it does a turn. And it just kind of cycles through this motor program uh, when, you, when you look at a video of it. But you can also see for the first time, you can see distributed across the brain, this, this motor program is actually there in the intentions, right, um, of, of the animal. 
Cool. So this is very cool. But um, my project uh, has started out uh, to try to get rid of that one pesky little word here at the at this previous thing. Get rid of this fictional part. So we want to understand the animal in its natural in its natural habitat, right? Because you could you could definitely argue it's it's a legitimate argument to say like, look, okay, you see the structure. Uh, but the animal's not actually doing anything. It's a very unnatural state. Um, it, it's hard to it's hard to know. It's hard to know if you can really generalize that. Um, so my project, which which uh, was very challenging, was to deal with this in freely moving animals. So um, let me tell you what the data look like. Right. First, we have this this behavioral uh, video. Right. So this is this is at 80 hertz. And we can annotate the, the forward, the backward, whatever uh, state it's doing, right? And it's doing these kind of natural behaviors. So it's just switching between them. And then we have this fluorescent videos. So this is um, the thing I was mentioning, Olaf. This is where you have a microscope and you take a three-dimensional video across time. So you have X, Y, Z, and then across time. And we have two different channels here. This is a reference channel. So this is not changing in brightness across time as much as possible. And then this channel is actually uh, changing brightness. It's very difficult to see, but it's uh, changing brightness as the worm is thinking, right? As the neurons are changing, it's changing brightness. And really, we have the first time to read the mind of the worm as it's actually uh, doing these behaviors. Um, and of course, I really have to thank uh, my collaborators here. I'm I'm the computational guy, but uh, there's there's a very important set of microscopy, like a huge set of microscope uh, skills that were needed for this, as well as a lot of biology uh, was needed to make this happen. So I really want to thank my my collaborators here. Um, but to to zoom in on what I was working on, I mean, when you when you have those videos. You have two core problems if you want to uh, do the analysis like people did in the immobilized animals and, and understand this question about manifolds. You have to track all the objects and you have to segment all the objects or you have to identify them. So in this case, I'm showing you kind of like the output. Uh, but basically, these, these are two very difficult problems. And I won't dive into too much detail because it's not, I think, that interesting. But I solved both of them with, with neural networks um, and I solved them separately. If you're interested, there there are quite a few publications on how to segment neurons, um, and it's basically a game of of collecting training data and and uh, using one of the the published things for segmentation. That's like relatively straightforward, um, but tracking was much more difficult. Um, and uh, I'm showing you here an example of like just the amount of motion that you can have across uh, our, our images, right? Because you really have uh, a very large uh, very amount of motion with very dense objects with non-rigid motion. And this is very difficult for classical image processing techniques or classic tracking techniques to deal with. Um, and so I used, uh, uh, I trained my own neural network, so I had to collect a lot of ground truth. Um, and we ended up using a graph neural network with attention to match point sets across time. It's also got a fancy name. It's called Superglue, which, which uh, was popular um, or which was published in 2020 and kind of got some attention. Um, but that's just for matching sets across time. And I just want to mention that, uh, you know, we have to do, we had to collect ground truth for like all of these different uh, neurons across thousands of time points. And I had to hire and, and build a front end GUI, a front end GUI so that um, undergraduates could, could sit there and, and annotate for a very long time. It, it took quite a, quite a long time. It was quite a project to actually gather this this uh, ground truth data. And I think that this last image also highlights one of the difficulties where you have this dramatic motion across one um, one snapshot, right? And you get these huge blurring artifacts and and the the, the neighbors just squish into each other. And uh, yeah, it, I think you can imagine why it's difficult for a computer to do this. Um, but through the power of of trained neural networks, um, you, you can you can do pretty well. Yeah. And what does that look like? That looks like this. So when we collect it all into into time series and when we sort them by their, their activity patterns, we see something very similar to what we saw in the previous immobilized case. And I'll have them side by side in a second. But the fundamental core 
top level lesson that we that we saw is that the low dimensional pattern, the, the dominant pattern is the same intention to behave, the same intention uh, uh, to, to do these different behaviors. We can annotate them by now the real behaviors, not these fictional behaviors. So now they're colored by real behaviors. Um, and we can, again, do the same thing where we do PCA and find that the dominant component is here associated with this reversal forward change, almost this binary switch. And, and as we go up in PCA components, we get this interesting additional structure, which I won't talk about too much, except to say that you can plot the same phase plot. You can see that these this smooth kind of population level activity exists here in these, in these freely moving animals, uh, which was really exciting to see, really exciting to see. Um, but there, there are some very interesting questions. Let me dive into this. So we have this observation, but let's let's understand it, right? Um, is it really is it really doing what we think it's doing? Um, one hypothesis, as I mentioned, is that there's some kind of intrinsic motor command. Um, in other words, some kind of intrinsic decision, right? That the brain is making a decision, and that's associated with this manifold. Um, another important thing that I will talk about more in detail is that. Uh, the animal is in a complex environment, right? It's, it's, it's actually sensing things as it behaves. And its sensory landscape is changing as it behaves, right? If I, if I, for example, if I change my head, my eyes, my field of view is also rotating as I change my head. But we have this magical ability, and I think you can do it quite easily, to focus on one point and rotate your head, and then your eyes can compensate. Feel free to look silly by, by shaking your head, but you can easily focus on one point and move your head and then your eyes uh, compensate perfectly for that motion, um, even though uh, it's, it's quite complicated to translate your neck muscle command into a compensatory eye motion command. That's a complex transformation, but you can do it uh, without thinking. So, so your sensory landscape is changing quite a bit, and that could be connected to this. And it is, in fact. And another thing is that it could be uh, doing something to or coordinating or giving context to other, other uh, types of neuron activity. So um, I, the best way to tackle these hypotheses is to directly compare the two sets of data that I introduced, the, the freely moving and the immobilized, where you kind of have gotten rid of the sensation and you're... In the immobilized case, you're focusing on these intrinsic decisions. Um, and, and then I'll talk a little bit about some Bayesian modeling to deal with the, the last part. Um, so now we click. Yes. So side by side, uh, when, we, when we directly compare the freely moving on the left and the immobilized on the right, we can see the high level similarities, both in the PCA modes, which is kind of going up and down associated with this now fictional reversal on the right. Um, and, and true reversal on the left. So there's these really high level similarities, but one key question, and then that the power of C. elegans allows us to answer, are these actually the same neurons? You know, it's the same pretty pattern, but is it the same brain area? Is it the same uh, neuron that's actually doing something? And uh, that can tell us a lot about the, the, the meaning of this activity. So uh, now I'm plotting this P the weights of different neurons for PC1 and and uh, if if they uh, so that's this time series right so if they are participating in this pattern versus uh, being anti correlated to that pattern and if they're up here on the positive side uh, you you don't have to worry too much about these neuron names people in, people in Wormland love their neuron names because we have these genetically stereotyped animals which have genetically stereotyped neurons. And we can give them pretty names, but you could also think of these as brain regions in another uh, situation or like the same neuron type in, in, a, in a different animal. But in C. elegans, we literally have the exact same neuron and we can literally compare those, those, those neurons. So these are some nice, beautiful reversal friends, which are broadly speaking, doing the same thing in, in both cases, both in the immobilized when it's just a decision and no execution and in the freely moving when it's execution and, and decision. And there's, there's friends on the opposite side that are forward active and are um, anti-correlated to these guys, right? So they're doing the same thing. They're kind of decision related, let's say. Um, however, there are super interesting exceptions, right? So there, there are these guys, which basically didn't do anything when they mobilized, but now suddenly in the freely moving case, they're very associated with this manifold. They're very associated with this dominant pattern. So this is a really interesting uh, exception. And 
there are many guys in the middle, which I, uh, feel free to ask questions about, but I'm not going to dive into them. Um, and, and we can approximate that about 77% of the neurons that we can identify are intrinsic, meaning that they have the same kind of uh, pattern of activity in both cases. They're either both associated with this behavior, the reversal, or they're associated with this behavior. They're doing the same thing in both cases. But there are these interesting cases where the encoding either switches, so it switches from positive to negative or vice versa, or they just are zero in, in the immobilized and they show up suddenly in the freely moving. So this highlights some, some interesting uh, special story about this. And I want to talk about this, this particular friend in, in more detail. So this friend uh, we can plot um, and zoom in on as, as a worm is behaving. So you can see a time series of this neuron here on the right. And as the, the worm goes forward, the neuron is pretty inactive. And then once it starts reversing, it uh, becomes quite active. And it's not just active, it's actually spiking here. And we were super interested to see like, okay, what's going on? This, this, this neuron is super unique. It's not doing this in, in the immobilized case, what's going on? And you can see that it's actually colliding, like the nose is touching the body here. It's colliding with itself. And you can see that it's gonna do the same thing at the second peak. It's gonna collide here again. And this is a very reliable uh, response of this neuron. And it's, it's, it was super interesting to us. And luckily, uh, we actually had a previous paper on this particular neuron in the lab that I was lucky enough to be a, a part of. And this neuron is a gas sensing neuron, a carbon dioxide sensing neuron. And we actually found that the worm, the animal is changing its environment as it's moving. It's producing carbon dioxide, and then it can smell that carbon dioxide. It can smell itself as it reverses into that. And we could do a simulation as it goes forward, 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 and then it goes reverse, and it goes into this big spike of CO2 uh, as it, as it um, goes over the area where it used to be. Yeah. So this is highly correlated to this manifold, but is a completely different causal pathway. It's, it's really going through the environment. It's sensing the environment. And then, um, and then uh, producing this correlated activity. And it's not just one neuron, it's, it's a set of neurons. I'm showing three of the, of the stronger examples where you have this really strong either reversal activity or at the opposite sense, this really strong forward activity, which is uh, all sensory. And we could actually uh, do a mutant to knock out the worm's ability to sense this carbon dioxide and oxygen. And we can see that this response is abolished. Um, so, so we can really do these causal manipulations in worms to understand what is the exact uh, the, the exact cause, the exact mechanism. Um, and this was with some other really actually wonderful collaborators and uh, just have to thank them. Yeah. So um, jumping into, into a pie chart, loosely speaking, we have some kind of 50% of, of all neurons, not just the identified neurons, about 50% of neurons seem to have the same activity uh, between the immobilized and freely moving uh, uh, situations. But there's a strong, about almost 10% of neurons, which are just sensing the consequences of this, of this uh, environmental um, change, just sensing the consequence of this behavior state. So even though they're correlated, there is this whole different causal pathway of this. Um, yeah. One, and, and so in my last little bit, I'll talk about the, the last hypothesis, which is that the manifold is potentially uh, functional. So it's actually potentially coordinating in the activity of, of individual neurons. Because so far I've, I've been describing things, right? I'm saying like, look, it's a decision, uh, but, but that's not necessarily affecting other neurons. It is a decision. And look, there's sensation, but again, it's not necessarily like affecting other neurons, but here we actually have an interaction. And that's what I'll talk about next. Um, and in particular, there's this um, hypothesis in, in the field that there's this multi-level interaction and, and there's a multi-level coordination of action. So this is the same action sequence that I showed before, um, but there are actions underneath that, right? So there's this kind of global state of going forward, but there's also these individual body motions that the, that the worm does. And in, uh, within like the various, the various global states, the body posture is actually the same. The curvature is the same um, between these different undulations, but do neurons actually know the difference? So we can see that the, the worm is going forward. It's doing this kind of, this, this curving, this sort of S shape. It goes backwards, it does the same shape. Turns are different, but uh, forward and backward, it's doing the same shapes. 
But uh, you could imagine that since the worm is representing this forward backward in its brain, maybe it's also using that to coordinate muscles or do some some other interesting things. So there, there was one very, very interesting suspicious neuron that we that we uh, dove into first. And this is a motor neuron. So it's at the motor level. And so we do expect that it's actually um, different between the forward and, and backward situations. And we can see, I think you can just sort of mentally see that there's this thing, there's this curvy thing, there's this oscillation that's happening here in the forward part. And then when the reversal comes about, it just dies off. It's, it's not doing that. It's just kind of becomes unstructured, it becomes noisy, right? We have noise in this data for sure, but it's very, very structured, very beautiful, and then, and then noise. So we can mathematically decompose this neuron into two pieces. This uh, PCA component, or this global component, which is shared with the rest of the brain, right? So it's this kind of like slow up and down, um, as I've shown you a couple times before. And so if I subtract uh, the red from the blue, I can get the, the thing that's the, the rest of it which is basically just this baseline activity. So in some sense, this is the global activity and this is sort of the private activity. This is the local activity that exists and it's not shared with like uh, the, the low dimensional component. It's not shared with the motor representation there. Um, but a key question is, is there actually an interaction between these things, right? Uh, or, or are these just kind of added on top of and the neuron is, I don't know, accidentally uh, expressing this or is this, actually functionally related, right? I can show you all the pretty pictures you want, but is there a functional mechanistic relationship between, between the global activity and the local private uh, single motor commands of, of, this, of this neuron? Um, and one very suggestive quantification that we did is to do a triggered average, which is to say that we take the body posture and at every time the body posture is the same little banana shape, we take the uh, we take the neurons activity and we separate that out into forward and then reverse and we can see that there's this nice structured activity during forward which is you know what you can see here but I'm showing you a pretty example so it's important to say that it that it generalizes across across uh, data sets across individuals um, and there is some there is some difference between these but we weren't just trying to target some specific uh, neuron we wanted to actually build a model. To, to explore this, this possibility across, across different uh, neurons in, in, a, in a quantitative way. So I'm, I'm gonna show you two different models. Uh, on the left here is a trace of a single neuron. And we can put a lot of different behavior quantifications in to try to explain this. So in this case, I, I'm showing you these kind of oscillatory shapes. People in the field call them eigenworms, but the point is that they're capturing the, the banana shapes of the, of the worm as it goes through these oscillations. And it could be that there's just a simple behavior encoding. You know, this neuron cares about behavior, doesn't care about the manifold, doesn't care about the global state, is not gated, is not organized, is, doesn't care, is just doing some behavior related thing. Um, which is kind of back to the circuit paradigm, right? It's just doing its own thing without worrying about um, um, any kind of population level activity. Or it could be uh, that, that there's some kind of uh, functional connection between these two things. And I think the simplest way is a sigmoid or a gating that is being caused by this manifold um, and then being applied to this behavior. And that's a better model of this, of this neuron. So what this looks like together is that we have some kind of oscillation, which happens regardless of the global state. And then we have this kind of gating function, which is just a function of the rest of the neurons, fun function of the brain. And is this neuron better modeled by this guy or by this guy? I'm putting this, doing the multiplication for you, is it better multi, uh, modeled by this or, or by this? And um, without going into too much detail, we find quite a few neurons that have this hierarchical signature that, ha that are much better modeled by this hierarchical model where the, the manifold is interacting with the, that single neuron activity. Um, and it's not all these neurons that are actually like really, really, really correlated with the manifold itself. It's this intermediate or even low correlation level that feel the most, um, that feel the most, let's say, coordination or feel the most hierarchical gating uh, by, by the manifold. And I, I want to show you uh, the, the, that we actually have an interpretation of what a lot of these neurons are doing 
because you have these banana shapes, you have these curvatures, and that forms a phase plot, right? There's 360 degrees of, of an oscillation. And now for the first time, we can actually plot the full relationship of these neurons as they encode the different phases of this body oscillation. So you can imagine in a monkey reaching, right? You have different muscles doing something different as the monkey reaches. And in this case, we have the exact analogy of, of the worm moving. And these guys are all hierarchically gated, right? So these guys are all paying attention to the context of the brain and they are, um, they are they're responding to it. Uh, I think a, a better way to visualize this is to look at the actual segmented objects and here in red is high activity and blue is low activity. And you can see that for this banana, this banana shape versus the opposite banana shape, this guy is very high activity. In this case, it's very low activity. In this case, it's this guy's very high activity. These guys are all high activity. And here it's blue. And, and for the most part, it's lower. I think I can, if I can click the right thing, I can show you a video. No, never mind. But I, uh, we, can, we can plot this. It's a little confusing, but we can plot this uh, across the video. And we can see that this is consistent. And um, it, it is exciting because it's actually an interaction between this really dominant thing and these really subtle, small amplitude uh, changes. OK, so in conclusion, um, we have several different functions of braid-wide motor representations, or in, in short, this manifold. We have this component, which is in this intrinsic motor command, which is similar to the philosophy stuff that I told you about originally, this decision-making stuff, yeah? But, and it, this is super important for me uh, or for anybody doing computational like analysis of data that you receive, there are correlated signals, which are co from a completely different cause. Um, and I think that there's there's no real way to, to deal with that um, unless you uh, go back to the biology and you actually do some additional experiments um, because it's just correlated. It's just highly correlated. Yeah. Um, and all of this is quite functional. It is actually organizing uh, smaller, finer detail motor patterns. Um, and and uh, it's it's, I think, the first step in this kind of um, building a brain. Even, even the small brains used this Lego block. Even the small brains used this ingredient. So, so I, I think that that, has, uh, that, gives it, that gives me a lot of confidence that it's the first step, let's say, for, for building a bigger brain. Um, and just my last slide about speculation. Um, you know, I would say that neuroscience and AI, you know, I mentioned convolutional neural networks, but I don't think that neuroscience has really, really strongly uh, sort of given something back to, to AI in like a, a conceptual level much recently, right? Transformers, LLMs, none of this is from neuroscience, right? None of this is like on, on how humans learn language or nothing like this. But I do wonder if manifolds could be, um, could be uh, one of the next concepts that, that does get adopted. Of course, there is work on, on modeling manifolds. There's lots of autoencoders or manifold modeling things. Um, and there's, there's, uh, uh, there, there's work there, but I think it would be particularly important for like motor tasks, these like super high dimensional um, motor tasks, like robot, uh, robotic things, and perhaps learning new motor programs, and also perhaps for for um, you know being able to reuse the same conceptual pattern like this this uh, manifold rotation that I mentioned with the monkey, uh, and perhaps being able to learn how to do more tasks uh, without without uh, catastrophic forgetting. This is total high level of speculation. So thank you for following me, following me this far. And uh, at the end, I just need to thank the lab. Uh, I've been really lucky to work in a very interdisciplinary lab. It is fundamentally an experimental lab. And so I've been welcomed in as a computational person and I really appreciate that. Um, yeah. Yeah, sweet. Okay. And in particular, here's the main collaborators that I worked with. But yeah, that's that's me. That's that's my That's my high level. That's my details. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Charlie. This was uh, really some, some really exciting stuff. Um, um, while everybody thinks of their own questions, uh, I'll try to formulate some we, myself. We got, we got a big hand here, I see. Oh, we have a hand. Then yeah. then let, let, let's bring out the hand. Uh, Peter? <laughs> yeah. no, oh, Martin. I saw Martin. I, uh, oh, it's on, Martin. On the video. Great. That's what I saw. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Is it okay? Uh, 
first of all, thank you for a very interesting uh, seminar. <laughs> really nice theory. But uh, you were kicking in, uh, kicking in open doors in my case. Huh? <laughs> uh, uh, first of all, yeah. yes, I agree yes. completely with uh, with the really importance of uh, manifolds. Uh, and I think it, 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 this is not speculation. This is, I think, I would say this is established. Depends a little bit on when we're in neuroscience you look. But I yeah. don't know if you're familiar with uh, uh, Jaden Fosch's uh, book, Conceptual Spaces. Uh, I am not familiar with that one. No, I know uh, that. It's the... MIT Press 2000. I can highly recommend it. Yeah. But, but sure. uh, I think the, the name of uh, manifolds, it, it has, there are many other names for the same concept. Uh, synergies is one. And that that is, uh, I think, more than 60 years old. But but it, it's, I wouldn't say it's speculation. It's uh, uh, very important. And I, I it, please let me give you a little bit background here for my yeah. main questions, which, which is a little bit later. Uh, I have uh, worked with, uh, or I work with uh, biologists at the uh, Department of Experimental Medical Science at Lund University. And we've started from a, a completely different starting point, but we have also reached the conclusion that, that uh, these manifolds are really important. And uh, we have, uh, we started building a mechanistic model of uh, generic mammalian neurons, starting from mm -hmm. ion channels. Mm -hmm. And uh, to make a long, short, long story short, we found it is possible to derive a mechanistic model of neuronal populations and population coding, even starting from that low level. And this leads cool. directly to manifolds, which in our case are actually uh, convex cones. Uh, mm -hmm. But that's also important for my question. Uh, so uh, uh, from this perspective, uh, the start of my question here is that if I remember right in C. elegans, C. elegans has only about 300 to 400 neurons depending on if, if it's a male or a female. And one could claim that, that C. elegans is more like a, a hardwired automaton implementing yeah. the four Fs, you know, uh, feed, yeah, fight, yeah. flight, and mate. Yes, uh, yes, yes. Uh, whereas uh, ma mammal is has more like a general purpose brain. So I think that one thing where you are a little bit provocative is to claim that, that C. elegans has a brain at all. Uh, it could be discussed if it even has a yeah. gang. Uh, yeah, so, yeah. so uh, uh, yeah. for a, a hardwired automaton like that, one could claim that the behaviors are really emer emergent uh, and, and not really uh, uh, very flexible. Yeah. Uh, so, so one thing for mammals that that I and my colleagues think are very important is uh, sparsity and uh, uh, the the uh, potential of hyperdimensional computing. And that would really require many more, uh, many higher dimensions. So, so uh, we think it's very important that we can have low dimensional manifolds in a very high dimensional space, but mm -hmm. C elegance doesn't really allow for uh, sparsity when it has so few neurons. Okay, so that was my question. So maybe you can say- Yeah, something. yeah let, me, let, me, let me say, I guess, yeah, a couple of points, because I think we could, I would love to talk maybe for an hour about this, or, uh, but, but I think that, yeah, so, so basically it could be argued that the way to build a tiny brain is to stack up circuits, stack up reflexes, stack up motor programs, you know, like just stack them up, right? And, and it, it is, I think, an open question Certainly, uh, people have strong opinions, but I think it's an open question of whether you can solve C. elegans in this way. And, and I think that it, it could be. It could be that you can fundamentally just you know stack up like you can do a five neuron study here, a three neuron study here, a four neuron study here, and and you just stack them up, and uh, yeah, you're good. Um, I kind of just stake out the ground or like philosophically think that um, that's not the case, um, and I think that. The way to start to show that is not the case is to say that there are these interactions between very large percentage of the neurons that that the, the neurons are are uh, responding to the context, not necessarily of every single other neuron, um, but but of a large percentage of other neurons. Um, and so we get you know, the, and and that's why I think this like dating aspect is quite important, where you have. Uh, individual neurons, quite a few individual neurons sort of responding to this like shared motor pattern. Um, but that's not to say that you can't mechanistically model things, right? I mean, like, you know, in physics, you can mechanistically model water, you can mechanistically model 
chemicals, right? I, I do think that's a very important research paradigm as well. Um, but at some point, more is different. And I think that um, the, the publishing a paper, let's say, that doesn't reference anything biochemical, but just references like a fixed point in an attractor landscape or a fixed point in a dynamical landscape, this I, I this is the kind of direction that I would like to push for even like C. elegans, and but then the question of like whether whether it's actually sort of is that that's what I'm trying to show right like that's that's not uh, that's not um, um, taken for granted right I do think that people have this idea that C. elegans is so simple that it's not it's not needed for this stuff it's only needed for the abstract things this is why I framed it in this way right like is is a manifold present here. Um, and if it is present, you know, is is it doing something kind of like uh, organizational or abstract, right? Um, in in this way, and that's that. So so I would say that we we take we took a step in this direction of saying like, look, it seems to be similar to these more abstract tasks that that um, you know, obviously monkeys are doing much more abstract tasks, but like it seems to be similar in in this in this high level way. Does that get at part of your question? Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Do we have some more questions? Is it okay to ask silly questions? Yes, please, please. Uh, yeah, yeah. I was, I was, I was curious. Was uh, was it like the the title of the talk? Was it intentionally intentionally going to to the book of by Chris Elias Smith, which is also called How to Build the Brain? I um. No, it came up in a conversation with my collaborators here. It's not it's not actually my title. It's one of my collaborators here on the on the photo you can see. Um, but uh, I, I I'm yeah, there there are a ton of very interesting popular books on on like neuroscience and neuroscience and AI and brains and so on. And I'm I'm not familiar with that one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was I was curious because in some sense you're partially kind of echoing with his idea that interesting. I should computations I should read it. are important. Yeah. Yeah, uh, one needs to worry about maybe one doesn't need to worry about single neurons, but about computing with populations of neurons. And yeah, I mean, that, yeah, maybe it's the message is somehow just there. The, it's, it's that was fun to see that at least yeah. I was expecting the, to the pointer at some point to the book. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, these ideas are, are are out there a lot, right? Like as as Martin mentioned, right? They're 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 totally out there, and as I try to. Say with like the monkey space, right? They're really they're being applied. They're 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 being used in real contexts. Um, it's not controversial that like manifolds exist. It's just like I think that there's this challenge of understanding like the causal, like what exactly, like where exactly do they come from, causally speaking, and like are even if it's correlated, is that really the same cause? Which which we can partially answer here in worms, uh, and, and to say no, right? Like it's definitely not, even though it's highly correlated. Um, and in the same way, like, is it actually how you build a brain or is it just like a thing that you need later? You know what I'm saying? For like how you build, let's say, let's say a monkey brain or a human brain, but how do you build any brain? That's, that's, that's yeah. yeah. Cool. But thank you for the reference. Yeah. And to Martin's point, I, I guess it's also like what you're saying, it partially kind of follows the neuro AI ideas that, that some people are promoting nowadays that, yeah, we, we can, yeah, we, we have to try to build like neural Turing tests and yeah, building C artificial C elegant might be a reasonable challenge. It's, it, it's probably not that easy to do that. Thanks. Um, there was a, in, in chat, uh, yes, it's, it's absolutely true that brain is really not the proper terminology for, for C elegans. They, they have a nervous system. It's true. It's true. But how to build a distributed nervous system <laughs> is less punchy. I'm glad you enjoyed the talk, uh, Peter. Yeah. Do you have some more questions? I guess I guess we're happy. I guess we're happy. Thank you very much, Charlie, for this for this talk. Yeah. Yeah. Uh,
Next uh, next week, we're back with uh, Jakob Amstorf, who is uh, at the uh, University of Copenhagen and the Pioneer Center of AI. He's going to talk about medical image analysis with limited labels. And this is going to be a hybrid talk. So, so very welcome to our office in Lund. And uh, as always, we're also uh, at Zoom. So welcome back next week. Thank you very much, Charlie. Thank you again for inviting me and, and uh, for everybody who came. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the great presentation. Yeah. Bye.